the first testing module that you saw earlier today was about introduction to the concept of testing, the definitions of the kinds of tests that exist, and how the tests can be devised. Uh, this presentation uh, is going to talk about uh, how do you devise tests for a complex software. Um, this is the license site slide. So we start out by thinking about how do you build your test suite? What forms a good collection of tests that will exercise your software in ways that you would like to uh, exercise them? So there are two levels of tests that we recognize. One is continuous integration, which has been promoted very strongly in the recent um, years. And that is basically that you um, it ensures that the tests that are uh, that as soon as you uh, do either a commit or a pull request is accepted into your repository, the tests immediately run and verify that nothing has failed. So these are designed for quick diagnosis of errors. Now, in a really complex software you cannot have a very comprehensive coverage in the continuous integration because uh, if your test suite runs for a number of hours and that's what you require to get the kind of coverage that uh, that makes you that gives you confidence in your uh, testing regime then you do have to think about the second level which is your nightly or scheduled testing so here you provide a much more comprehensive coverage and this may be long running in the sense that it may take a, um, the, the collection of tests that you're running may run for several hours uh, and that may just be necessary to um, run your test. So when you are devising your test suite, you should think about a mix of granularity because the rule of thumb that we work with always is that we want the tests to be as simple as possible and we want to be able to enable quick pinpointing of error uh, by examining various tests that have been run, which means that you try to devise um, tests for isolated components, which deviating a little bit from the standard terminology, I'm calling unit test, uh, it may not be just a single routine, it may be a co collection of functions but it is an isolated component within your code and uh, at that level the if a fault if a test fails then that tells you that the fault lies in that isolated component uh, this as we have said before is a necessary but not sufficient condition because uh, then you have to start um, having to, to uh, interoperate these various components and therefore when you start to mix them you need to have tests at the integration level um, which range from simple to complex and so they happen at integration level as well as system level. Now in scientific world you also need a class of tests that you don't normally hear about and these are restart tests. The reason why they're, they are required is that uh, at high performance computing facilities till today, you submit your uh, run into a batch queue. And usually the slot given to you in the batch queue may not be enough to um, complete your simulation in just one instance of the batch queue. So you may, not, may, may need to run your simulation campaign over multiple instances of submission into the batch queue. But then you want to be able to start your test uh, from where you had, uh, I mean, uh, start your simulation from the point where you stopped last time and you uh, are able to continue from that point to evolve to the next stage and so on and so on. Uh, so the idea behind restart tests is that you want to ensure that your code is able to have a transparent restart. What we mean by a transparent restart is that if you have a point A, a point B, and a point C and in the process of evolution of your simulation, then if you run your code from point A to point B, took a checkpoint, restarted from point B, and ran it to point C, versus if you ran your code all the way from point A to point C, the outcome you have are identical. 
Uh, and that is what we mean by transparent restart. So you need to have these kinds of restart tests built into your test suite uh, for a comprehensive coverage in the scientific world. You can find a lot of the, the, these resources, useful resources about testing in the IDEAS productivity website in the how-tos that are uh, part of that website. The question arises, why not always use the most stringent testing? And the answer really lies with the resources available to the team. No team has infinite resources and any uh, effort that is taken in devising, running and maintaining a test suite is effectively a tax on the team. Uh, and so the team has to carefully judge when the tax is just right, because when the tax is too high, the team is spending too long in devising test, uh, tests, then it's not able to meet its code use objectives because lots of time is taken away in developing tests. At the same time, if the tax is too low, which means if the uh, team is not spending enough time in thinking about how to test the code and developing tests, then it is possible that the defects sneak through and necessary oversight is not provided. Basically, you should be evaluating project needs and uh, expected use of the code. So if it's a one-off test, for example, it may not need uh, very complex testing. Um, it may just be enough to verify that it works for the job that you want it to do. It depends upon life cycle stage, the size and heterogeneity of the team as well as the code. Uh, life cycle stage, for example, when the code is new and in particular, if it is a numerical method, you're testing not just for correctness, you're also testing for stability and uh, uh, um, accuracy. When you are going into production, you may be taking the code into regimes that it hasn't been exercised before and you may need to do some predictive testing. And in refactoring, you may need to uh, make sure that you are testing for any part of the code that you are touching during refactoring and making sure that it isn't. Uh, a few additional things to keep in mind in terms of good pra testing practices. One of them was mentioned in the earlier uh, part of the testing presentation, and that is verified code coverage. And to re-emphasize, not just the coverage of the lines of code that you have, but also the way in which these lines of codes interact with one another, the components interact with one another. That is an integral part of code coverage. Uh, you must have consistent policies for dealing with failed tests, and those come from things like issue tracking, how quickly does the code need to be fixed? Who is responsible for fixing it? When I say how quickly does it need to be fixed, for example, if an error has been found in an obscure part of the code that only one particular type of uh, simulation needs and no one is running that simulation, then it is possible that you can delay uh, attending to that fault. Whereas if the fault is something that affects um, say an ongoing uh, science campaign or um, your users in a, an immediate way, then that error needs to be fixed immediately too. Uh, someone should be watching the test suite and someone should be making sure that these decisions about um, the errors to be fixed are made in a timely fashion. Uh, when one is refactoring a code or adding new features, a regression test Regression suite should be run with before check-in because it may happen that the part that you're working on you haven't affected, but it may have affected behavior elsewhere in the code. Code review before releasing a test suite is always useful. It always, uh, because someone coming in with a fresh eyes may spot something that you haven't because you've been living with the code for so long. This is an incredibly cost-effective method and is strongly encouraged. Uh, now I move on to examples about development of tests. So first one is the test development for new code, where usually the development of uh, tests and diagnostics goes hand in hand with code development. I alluded to this earlier also in that uh, you, it is always good to have in your arsenal some diagnostics that is not dependent upon bitwise uh, exact equivalent uh, equivalence between the results uh, results expected out of tests. 
It could be something as simple as, for example, if you're working with a conservative method, that you ensure that the quantities are conserved. And these kinds of diagnostics are important because it's not uh, always possible to run a test in a situation where there is no machine precision level uh, drift in the values and you want to be able to convince yourself that that drift is because of machine precision and not because of an error introduced inadvertently. And you should compare against um, and so these these usually come about because you can do have a simple analytical or semi-analytical solution that you can run your code against and convince uh, and use that as diagnostic. Um, as we mentioned before, building granularity into testing is extremely important. This granularity can be used um, to build a scaffolding, and it will be. Uh, I'll explain that uh, a little bit later. Uh, so you can build the scaffolding to build confidence in your uh, testing. You should always inject errors to verify that the test is working. And I will say this: that it is non-trivial to devise good tests, but it is extremely important. Second example is how to develop tests for a legacy code. So this comes from E3SM, where um, the tests that may have been developed when the codes were being developed are no longer available. And so the only option available to the users of the code, when they, even when they were developed, would be dealing with just one component of the code was that they'd have to run the whole model. And this could take hours, and it needed to be submitted as a job queue. And so clearly, this wasn't a great state to be in in order to uh, um, develop it it was very wasteful of people's time so we devised this methodology where we isolate a small area of the code that we want to test so this is the area of the code that we isolate uh, now in order for to, to start from this point what we do is we dump a state snapshot and this becomes a read-in for the test itself so we don't need to run the entire model. We just need to take a snapshot of the state that it is at the point at this point that we reached. Um, we build a test driver that uh, reads in this state. It all, also only wants to work with files that are sitting in this area. So what we do is we link in any dependencies, but sometimes so uh, sometimes what happens is a dependency may be having further dependencies, in which case you may want to uh, prune the dependency. So you create a custom copy of the file that this driver can invoke. Basically, what you're doing is you're isolating all of the dependencies into this one particular uh, test unit. Now what you do is with this, you have um, your uh, granular code uh, test ready so you can Start from the read in saved, you can read in the saved state and you can run the test and you can verify corrections. And remember, always inject error to verify that the test is working. So, this is how you can develop a test for a legacy code, one methodology, not the only one, but one method. In this third and final example, we go to uh, uh, building scaffolding in order to and structuring the tests in order to pinpoint bugs. So uh, the picture, it starts from the bottom up. And uh, so you can have components that can be exercised against known simpler applications. And that applies to combination of components also. Then you build a scaffolding to gain, uh, of verification to gain confidence. For example, in this picture, what you're seeing is the gray circles are mocked up dependencies, which means that you can run this test without exercising any other component of the code. Whereas when you're looking at blue, that that implies that uh, by itself, the uh, this test will not run and will not give you much information. But if all of its dependencies have been verified, then this will effectively verify the code. Uh, I'll take a more concrete example to explain this idea in a little bit more detail. This third and final example builds the scaffolding of tests that enables quick pinpointing of error in a relatively complex situation. So what we are looking at is a shock hydrodynamics code that runs on adaptive mesh refinement. And what we want to do is we want to build tests so that we can pinpoint errors that happen uh, in various we can pinpoint which part of the code is causing the error to happen. Uh, 
So the first test we build is a guard cell fill test. The guard cell or halo cells are the cells that surround the uh, points that you want to update in the part of domain that has been given to your rank and the halo cells consist of values from the adjacent rank which are needed for you to update the data that has been mapped on to you. So this simple test just requires two variables. One variable you initialize just on the interior points or the points that belong to you that is if you that are mapped onto your own rank. So you don't put any values in the halo cells. The second variable you initialize not just the interiors but also the halo cells and then you do a guard cell exchange on the first variable if the values in halo cells of the first and the second variables are identical then this test is successful similarly you can build another test for equation of state where you make sure that the uh, calculation of energy from uh, density and temperature is consistent with calculation of pressure with uh, density and temperature. So these are standalone tests and that's why they have gray on them. Now comes the building of scaffolding because to exercise hydrodynamics which is the shock hydrodynamics you cannot really run this independently. You need to have a mesh and you need to have an equation of state. But there is this problem called the Sadov test problem where if you place a pressure spike in the center, it uh, goes outward in a sphere and the distance that the shock will have traveled is known analytically. So this is the test we run on uh, in order to verify the hydrodynamics. So what we do is we have the guard cell fill test, which is a standalone test. We have an equation of state a state test which is a standalone test. Now we have a hydro test which has dependencies on guard cell fill and equation of state te uh, test but if both of those tests have passed and the hydro test passes uh, and the hydro test fails then we know that the fault lies in um, hydrodynamics and not in any of the other parts. And although it exercises mesh, hydro and eosh US all of them but it does effectively become a way of isolating error in hydro. Now if we are exercising uh, the mesh in an adaptive mesh mode where the resolution changes depending upon how much is going on in the domain then we need additional things and again here the structure of the code and structuring of the tests becomes import important. For AMR we need to check for flux correction and regrading. So this is how we structure our tests. Uh, we reason about correctness for flux correction and regrading by running the same test in many ways. So if our guard cell fill test and equation of test unit tests passed for both um, AMR and uniform grid, then we run hydro without AMR, which means we run it on uniform grid. If failed, then we know that fault is in hydro. Now if hydro passed on uniform grid, now we run hydro with AMR but without any dynamic refinement uh, which means that if a failure is, it now occurs it happened in flux correction. Finally we turn on dynamic refinement also and if it fails we know that the fault is in regrading. So this is how by making use of running the same test in many different ways we are able to pinpoint the source of error. Uh, and the final thing that I want to talk about is, is figuring out how to provide coverage for interoperabilities. And this is just one of an example that we use in the code that I work with, which is FlashX. But uh, it may not work everywhere, but for some, some kinds of codes, it will work. So what we do is we create this matrix uh, where we have uh, one set of capabilities along the uh, rows and one set of capabilities along the uh, column. Then we run our various tests and we mark them. Uh, so for every test that we run in the matrix, we place an entry for it if it exercises interoperability between those two components. For example, CL stands for a cellular test. When it is run in AMR mode, it exercises interoperability between AMR and hydro. 
AMR and equation of state, AMR and burn and particles. And being on the same row, it also ensures that the interoperability of hydro with this particular version of equation of state, burn and particle is also ensured. So all these letters that you're seeing are just different tests and they're just filling up the uh, matrix. And it is also important to note that not all entries in the matrix need, may need to be filled. You just have to make sure that you know which of these need to be marked and mark them all appropriately. The way we pick tests, uh, follows this algorithm that first um, entry we, we pick all the unit tests including full module tests then we start to pick tests which are sensitive to perturbations because they are they uh, if there is a fault they um, fail very quickly next round we uh, take the most stringent test for a given solver and then finally if we still have spots that are um, not filled and we need them filled, then we pick out least complex, complex tests that cover the remaining spots. So the takeaway from this um, uh, presentation is that we have to understand the con context, understand testing needs and cost. We need to devise tests that enable quick pinpointing of errors. We have to test at various granularities and various complexities. And we have to maintain a holistic validation strategy, which, which means that you think globally and you act locally. And, and that is all I had. Uh, I'd be happy to take questions.